Hey out there, I'm Bob Hughes, JD Squared. Thank you very much for tuning in. In this JD Squared Rotary Cutter project video, we're gonna be making a barbell rack. Basically, it holds Olympic-sized barbells, like this right here. It'll hold up to 10 of them. And what it was, my wife goes to a CrossFit place, and her trainer um, needed some more of these. Of course, being my wife, she goes, oh, don't worry about it. My husband will make them for you, no problem. So here we are, we're making barbell rack. Anyway, we're gonna make it out of two by two box tubing. We're gonna make it um, also out of one and a half by three. You're gonna see some of the new features in our software for the machine called wedge cutting. Wedge cutting is super, super cool. That's this rounded edge right here. At the end of the first part of the video where I show the finished part, you'll be able to see it real clear. You're also gonna be able to see it during the welding process. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break the video into two pieces. The first part, is gonna be the machine operating, cutting. We're gonna to go to welding, weld the part up, all the way to completion. The second part of the video will be how I created the barbell rack in our software, which is called Camelot. Clearly, that's probably only of interest to anybody who um, already has our machine. So anyway, grab your coffee, sit back, enjoy. Once again, thanks for tuning in. We got lucky. I had already been working on a job that was two by two box tubing. So um, the four by four stabilizer for square tubing was already in the machine. In case you don't know, this will handle anything up to four by four. So piece of two by two, one by two, whatever, it'll work in the four inch square tube stabilizer. And um, since it's already in the machine, that's kind of nice. Now the reason it was, this is what we were working on here recently. And this is what we call wedge cuts to where we basically cut a wedge out of three sides of the square rectangular tubing, and then we could fold it over, get it to the right angle, weld up the three sides, and then you have a very, very pretty bend. You got a nice smooth outside with no ungainly or unsightly welds, like if you just miter it. It makes for a very uh, polished looking piece, very professional looking piece. So anyway, this is what we're gonna be cutting. Our first two pieces are gonna look pretty much just like this, without all the squares right here cut out. So let's set that down. Now, the machine's already set up for the square, the two inch square, so we got lucky there. Now what we need to do, since this is the first time in the day that we started the machine, um, I went ahead and I homed it, no big deal. That's subject other videos, piece of cake. What we need to do now is tell the machine where the tubing is at, where the chuck is, center of rotation. Now to do that, we've created what we call wizards. So if I go over here on the screen, I go to the top right, I go to plasma, then I go to wizards, and right here it popped up the square tube stabilizer wizard, or the square tube wizard, because that's what I was using the other day. It remembers kind of where it was at. So I've already filled in the boxes, two inch wide, two inch tall, with a quarter inch radius on the corners of the box tubing. All I have to do now is I hit a button generate, and what it did, it generated a little program and copied it into the run section of the RC6. So if I go back to the plasma cut section, <clears throat> there's the program. What I've got to do is run it. But first, in order to run that program, what it's telling me, and you can't see, is using your eyeballs, flatten the tubing out, get it as flat as you can, move the torch to the middle of the tubing, about a one inch above it, and then hit the go button. So let's go ahead first and rotate the chuck around. And like I said, I'm just doing this eyeball. I don't have to have it perfect. So that looks pretty good there. Let's go ahead now and move the torch in. All right, let me walk up, take a look. Yeah, it's a little bit out, a little bit too far. Let's go in just a hair right there. And I wanna be within an inch or so. I'm looking good. Let me go ahead and hit the run button and I'll tell you what it's doing. First thing it's gonna do, it's gonna move over to each side of the tube and it's going to find out how out of line it is. And then it's gonna rotate it. Now it's double checking that to see if it corrected it. It did. So now it's gonna to touch off on each side of the tubing. That's why we had to put in the radius of the corner so we know how far down to go. Now that's gonna give it the center of rotation this way. Now it's gonna spin. It's going to touch off the tube again. Remember, we told it it was two inch by two inch. So it just verified that, yeah, 
you have got a piece of two inch by two inch tubing in there, I'm good to go. All right, the next thing we need to do is tell the machine where to start running this program. Now, typically when you create a program, you're gonna create it to start at the end of the tube and work back towards the chuck. That's exactly what I did. So, I've moved the chuck down, or the torch down, I'm sorry, until it's near the end of the tubing. All I've gotta do is come over here and click the Y0 button to set that as the origin of the program. The Y axis is going up and down the machine this way. We have labels on the machine identifying it. We basically just said, hey, Y0 is right there. You're good to go. And of course, X is in and out, Z is up and down. All right, we're, re we're good to go. The machine's ready as far as uh, getting the tube in and all. Let's go ahead and load up the program and um, hit the go button. I've repositioned the camera so I could show you the screen a little bit better. What I did a minute ago is I went right here to Wizards, and this is the Wizard page where I picked up the square tube rectangular um, tube Wizard, and I filled out the information. For instance, up here I put the, you know, the two by two by quarter inch here, 0.25, and then I hit generate here. Now, if I go back to Plasma Cut, it placed that stub program right in here. That's what I ran to square the tube. What we're going to do now is we're going to go to File, Import, NGC, which is the numerical code. It's on my USB drive, and I'm picking the first program that I generated in Camelot, which was Barbell Rack 1 2x2. Two two. Double click on it. It loads it right here. Now there's your torch, there's your cut that it's going to be making. We now need to go ahead and tell it what material we're working for or working on. So let's go here to select settings. We're going to tell it that it's Power Max 85. That's all we've got. The material is mild steel. It's going to be a little heavier than 12 gauge. It's going to be 10 gauge. And we've got a 45 amp shielded consumable in there. It's important to tell the machine what consumables in the machine to get a good quality cut. So if I say OK, now I go ahead and I will reposition the camera and we'll hit the run button. I just turned on the through the spindle coolant. It's very important when you're cutting hollow sections like this, you want a good quality cut. Now I'm going to raise the torch up out of the way a little bit. Get in the habit of doing that if you've got one of our machines because let's say you're doing two by four and you've touched off on the two inch side. Well, when the part goes to rotate, it may hit the torch, dislodge it, doesn't hurt the machine, it just turns it off, which means you have to go to home it or rehome it. So I like to raise the torch out of the way to prevent that from happening. Now all I have to do is hit the run button.
Well, this is one of the two parts that we just cut out. So we're now going to go ahead and I will show you how to convert the machine over to do the one and a half by three inch angle. But that is what a wedge cut looks like right there before we bend it. All right, I'm going to need my readers for this because I'm going to be using these gauges right here that we provide with the square tube stabilizer and they have digits engraved in them. For instance, 1.7523. This is how we set the square stabilizer so that um, it'll work with different sizes of tube. Let's go ahead and start. I need to go ahead and pull out the tubing here. All right, that's that two by two that we were working on earlier. And what I want to do is go ahead and break loose the four yoke bolts. So we're gonna do that. Can't say they're not in there good. All right, that'll pull them off. We're gonna do all four of them here real quick. Now, these back bolts are actually threaded into the steel so that you don't have to worry about stripping them out in the future. So what we've got here is all four of them are loose. Now, as noted in previous videos, I've marked two of them with just basically put a little hammer mark on each end. This is one of them. Now, what I'm gonna do is on this one here, it's basically the bolt is on the inside here. I'm gonna set that for the one and a half inch. And the way I do that, is I pick my one and a half inch gauge and I literally just place it right here, pull the yoke up so that I kind of trap it between the pin. Now all I need to do is tighten it up. Okay, that one is set for the inch and a half. Now on the others, um, they're going to be three inches, so we're going to have to go to the outside holes. And the way it works is the, the holes can be, or the bolts can be placed in one or two position. The inside will handle up to about two and a quarter inch. The outside holes will handle up to four inch from like two and a quarter to four. So we need to go ahead and move these two yokes out, the bolt out. So let me go get my um, impact wrench. It's the quickest, easiest way to do it and I'll show you how we do that. I'm gonna go ahead and move the torque, I mean the whole machine a little bit away from the, um, from the chuck right here, because what I am wanna do is these bolts here that I need to move to the outside, you can see right here where I can move this bolt to that bolt there. It's gonna be easier to use an impact wrench and just unscrew them from the rear. Now if I put it in the outside bolt hole, run it all the way in, that's it. That's all there is to it. Fairly simple. Let's do the same thing to this one here. Alrighty. Now, I'm gonna take one of the yokes and I'm gonna use the gauge marked with the three on it. Yep, the three. And I'm gonna set that one next to the other one that I had set. So this one is still floating. This one is solid. Let's go ahead and find out which one has the marks on it. Let's see here. Okay, this one does. And all it is, it's a little mark that I had hammered on the end so that I know, or I know, which yokes I have set with the gauges. So we need to set this one right next to the other one. So we'll do it up here, good as place as any. And all you gotta do is put the three right here, pull it up like this here, just like that, so that it's wedged between the pin. Let's put the bolts on the outside. This was about the simplest method that I could figure out that could be used around the whole world. In other words, are you doing um, metric? Are you doing you know 50 millimeter tube? Are you doing two inch tube? It matters, it makes a big difference. So anyway, there we go. We now have two gauges here that are set. One is set in for the inch and a half side of the two, of the one and a half by three, one is set by three. The other ones are going to free float right here and we're not gonna set them or adjust them until I put in 
the, um, the actual tubing itself. So let me go grab that. I went over to the welding department and I had them cut me some three quarter inch pieces of coal rolled to act as a spacer on the two outside jaws that are not going to contact the tubing. Remember we have one and a half by three, so we have to make up that inch and a half somewhere and we're going to do it with these two spacers. All I'm going to do is I'm going to lay one on the back jaw, I'm going to push the tubing down onto it, and then I'm going to roll this one in place here, and that's it. Our tubing is in the machine. Let's go down and adjust the two other free-floating yokes, and we're about ready to go. Now that we've got the chuck tightened down, we have to adjust the two remaining free-floating yokes. It's very simple. Rotate the chuck so that the two yokes that we had adjusted earlier to inch and a half and three inches are on the bottom forming a V. Lay the tubing in the V. Now all we have to do is allow the yokes to come down and rest on the tubing lightly, tighten them up. One, do the same thing for the second one right here. Now use a little wrench on the back side back here because it helps to prevent the whole thing from trying to spin on me. That's why I've got the ratchet back here. Okay, let me just put a little bit of bite on this. There we go. Alrighty. We're set up right here. We've got the tube is completely in the machine. We now have to go ahead and rerun the wizard because we have changed the size of the tubing and the configuration. Let me go ahead and um, reposition the camera and I can show you a little bit better what we're talking about. Earlier, we were using two by two box tubing, so it didn't matter to the machine which face was facing up. They were all four the same. It's gonna cut the part out regardless. However, this piece is a piece of rectangle. Now, the program was generated starting cutting on the wide flat side, the three inch side. So we have to rerun our wizard and tell so that Camelot knows, or I'm sorry, the RC6 knows that the three inch side is facing up and that the part is an inch and a half tall. Let me go down there and do that. First thing we're gonna to wanna to do is, as we did before, we're gonna to want to eyeball the tubing flat. We're gonna to want to move the, the torch to the middle of it roughly. Let's see what we've got. It looks like I'll bump, in, I'll bump down a little bit and in a little bit. That should be good right there. Yeah, a little bit more. You want to be as close to the center as you can, eyeball. Let's go ahead and bring back up the wizard. Three inch, one and a half, quarter inch on the round. Generate that stub program. Go back to plasma cut. Okay, now I can hit run here. And it's going to do exactly what it did earlier. It's going to square this tubing and it's going to measure it and locate the center of the chuck rotation, which really hasn't changed if you think about it. All we're really doing in this step is telling the machine, we want you to know that the wide side of the rectangular tubing is facing up. Okay, looks real good, right? Let's go ahead and move the torch to the end of the um, tube down here. I think I got to reposition, yeah, let me reposition the camera. You can see a little bit better uh, what's going on. I'm gonna go ahead and move the carriage down to the end of the tube. Notice the automatic lifter got out of the way. The cool thing about the RC6 is once you install an automatic lifter, if you were to go ahead and change programs or change parts, it doesn't matter because the RC6 will always remember where that lifter is until you tell it it's either out of the machine or moved to a different spot. What I'm looking at right now is to see am I near the end of the tubing, which I am. Now, we've gone ahead and changed the profile of the workpiece. We've gone from two by two to inch and a half by three inch rectangle. So we're gonna to wanna to rerun the wizard. So as we did before, We'll go ahead and we will rotate, and I could use the chuck, by the way, as a good visual indicator. When the jaw is facing up, I'm pretty darn close to the middle. Now I'm gonna look down the tube. Looks like I need to move in just a little bit, and clearly we're, near, we're gonna need to move down. 
So let's go down a little bit. Like to be within about an inch from the top of the tube. I believe I mentioned that earlier. All righty. That looks pretty good. I think we can go ahead and run it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to run the wizard just like we did before. So I'm going to go to my menu here. I'm going to go to wizards. I'm going to get the rectangular wizard and I am going to set the width this way here, the x-axis of the tubing, to three inches, and I'm going to set the height to inch and a half and the corner radius to quarter, on a, to quarter inch. Remember, the width is where the program is going to start cutting. That's why we need to tell it that it's a three inch is the width and not the inch and a half because we're starting in that orientation. Let's go ahead, generate that program, go back to plasma cut, and we'll run that program. There we go. Pretty easy. As before, it's squaring the chuck, squaring the tube. All right, we're all done with that. It's going to find the center. Now, this tape that you see on the outside here, uh, last project we did, uh, I did a long truss, and it was the, a piece longer than the capacity of the machine. The machine, in a 24-foot configuration, has a cutting length of around 22 and a half feet because we're losing distance on the carriage, just the way it is. We did it this way so that we can guarantee we can load up 20-foot pieces, which are the most common length of material used in the industry. All right, we are ready at this point to go, other than the fact that we're going to want to tell the RC6 that this is our Y0 point, where we want the program to start. So let me go down there. All I got to do is hit the Y0 button on that, no problem. Now. What I need to do is tell it the material. So I'm going to go tell the RC6 it's mild steel. I'm going to tell it it's 10 gauge. Even though 10 gauge is 135 wall, this is 120, it's close enough. And then I'm also going to tell it the consumables that we have loaded. It's got a fine cut shield at default, but the consumable is the nozzles. And it's right here. And we currently have a 45 amp shielded nozzle in it, so I changed that over there. I need to go ahead and load up the program real quick that we're going to run, so I'm going to go to File, Import, NGC. I'll pick our program. It was on the USB drive that I brought out earlier, and there's our program loaded, and that's the cut path that it's going to be taken right there. I'm going to go ahead, turn on to through the spindle coolant, makes a huge difference in cut quality and we're going to give it a second to get to the end of the tube. The other thing I've, I've kind of done already is raised up the torch a little bit. Give it a second for the coolant to get down here. Reason I did that is if the program for some reason did need to rotate before it started cutting, we want to get the torch out of the way. Even though it's got a magnetic breakaway head, we don't want to stop the machine. So let's just get it out of the way. All right, we are now able to go ahead and hit the run button. There you go. See what I was talking about? It's spinning right there. Let me go ahead. I'm going to try to zoom the camera in a little bit on you. I'm not very good at this, so it might be a little shaky. Yeah, the cuts are looking really, really nice right here. This is clearly one of the bottom pieces because we're not cutting the holes all the way through it. These are the wedge cuts right here that we're going to be bending up to here in a few minutes when we weld this together.
Now, the part's getting ready to drop into the tray. It doesn't hurt a thing. There you go. All righty. Go ahead and start cutting on the second part and we'll pull that one out. All right. The one thing coolant will help with is keeping your part cool. So you can see this is the part that we're gonna be bending down and welding to the other part. We gotta make three more of them. I'm gonna go ahead and let the machine keep running so you can see it because I've been told by some people that they find it relatively relaxing to watch the machine run. So if you wanna go ahead, you could fast forward till we're done with this because we're heading to the welding department next. I just noticed when I was talking earlier about when I was talking earlier about the part we did, I don't think I was in the screen. Um, I'm still kind of not, but anyway, this is the part right here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now, if you notice, this one is flipping for both sides. I'm gonna go ahead and move the camera a little bit closer. There we go. Yeah, I think that's good. This will be the top rail that the barbells are gonna slide through into the bottom rail that we just cut a minute ago. Yep. Now here in a second, you're gonna see the automatic lifter right here drop out of the way and stay out of the way until the torch clears it. And as I mentioned earlier, you can go ahead and fast forward this if you want to go see the welding process. Um, it's funny, I've had people actually tell me if I could uh, make videos with longer cuts in them just because they find it very relaxing to sit and watch the machine run. I can't disagree with them. Now these wedge cuts are possible because we spent about nine months rewriting the algorithms for torch height control. Because if you actually look at a, um, a cut, that's ah, a little warm, the cut actually backs up across itself. With a normal torch height control system, with a normal torch height control system, what would happen is the torch would dive into the part. So we were gonna look at 
let's just say this part right here, see if I can get it in the camera. Yeah, right here, this area here, yeah, you can see it, is where the torch is backing up on itself. It's a very, very sophisticated torch height control system we developed for the RC6s. It's actually the same exact torch height control system that you see in our flatbeds also. All right, this will be our last part that we're gonna need right here. Okay, I've come back into the welding area. This is our six pieces right here. So this is the pieces that are gonna go on each end. And these are the pieces that we cut out that are going to connect the ends and the barbell is gonna drop through. The idea of the wedge cut, as I mentioned earlier, is we cut out this V slot right there. You can see it, see it right there. And we're gonna bend down the ends until it closes down on itself. Now, there's a few tricks to doing the wedge cuts. Check the video out where I talk about how to set the variables. There's only a couple that matter. It's a very simple process, but check that video out. Now, let me show you another thing I've done right here. When we first started working on this, we needed a press, right? So we just real quick, we built this press in about six hours. It was all laser cut, very little machining. We're gonna be using this. <clears throat> when I got it all done, you know, um, a guy, you know, a guy goes, hey, Bob, you know, you went to Harbor Freight to get the hydraulic cylinder. Why didn't you just buy a hydraulic press instead of building one? They're only like two, three hundred bucks. And I was like, shut up. You know, never even thought about it. Anyway, we built this press right here. If you're going to do this with our machines, just go to Harbor Freight, get yourself an H-frame press. I think that's what they're called. And um, that'll give you plenty of room to build it. But you will need to make a couple of custom attachments. And that's these rollers right here. Well, heck, I'll go ahead and pick that up. Anyway, these are the two rollers that we made, one narrow and one large, because when you start bending on the V-gap, you're gonna run out of room. If you've got a really big V, for instance, these particular rollers here may drop into the V. That wouldn't work. So we made two sizes, big and large. If you're curious in something about like this press or whatever, uh, give me a call. I'll talk to you about it. We're not sure. We've had a couple people ask us to build this press and to market it. We're not sure what we want to do. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to load up into our little press right here, and we're going to do this. We're going to bend it down until we can eyeball with the ruler that this is straight with this. You can see this one hasn't been bent. This one has bent, and we um, has been bent, and we put a couple tack welds. So let's go ahead and start that process. Let's go ahead and start by doing these end pieces. So we're gonna make these bends just the way I described a minute ago. Using our press right here, I've gone ahead and I've moved the, the rods and the rollers into where I think we're gonna be able to do this in one shot. And the idea being is we're gonna use the small roller system here and it's clearing both sides of the V notch because it's not very big tube and it's only two by two, right? Let's go ahead, put it in here. Now what I'm doing is I'm eyeballing the V, making sure it's in the middle of the press. Let's go ahead and go forward a little bit. Okay, all righty, let's take a look. 
Hey, we gotta go quite a bit. And what I'm doing is I'm running out of leverage right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna back off a little bit and I'm gonna move the pins and the rollers to the outside holes. That'll give me more leverage. Eyeball it back to square. Oh yeah, huge difference. All right, now I'm gonna take this ruler and I'm just basically eyeballing, putting it even with the bottom of that part. And it looks like to me we gotta go a hair more. All right. Wow, that V really closed up nice. I'll get a close up for you here in a minute and show you. Um, yeah, that's pretty darn good. Let me go ahead and pull this camera over here so you can see it. So she's gonna shake a little bit. Let's see here. All righty. Okay, I think you can see that pretty good. We're closed down real good. Now in the real world, this is gap one, gap two. I would have probably increased gap two by, I don't know, 20, 30 thousandths of an inch, but I would have probably left gap one alone. Those are the two that we care about. Tad, I mean, Chad, would you mind spot welding that for me there? Tack welding it. Okay, is that gonna be enough? All righty. Now all we got to do is release the, release it, pull it out. Go ahead and pop one on the other side there, if you don't mind. All right, let's see what we got here. I'm just going to hold the camera. All right, that's our first piece right there. Let's go ahead and I will do the second piece, but I'm going to hold, I'm going to stop the camera right here um, until I got something cooler to show you. All right, let's pop that out. If you could do me a favor, hit me a weld there. Excellent. All right, what we've got now, let's see if I need to move the camera over a little bit. Is that about right, guys? Yeah, it ain't so bad. All right. Well, there you go. There's our two side pieces. Now, you see why I love wedge cuts so much? If you look at how nice that looks on the outside, once we weld this down and grind it smooth, it's gonna be beautiful. And that's the advantage that our rotary cutters at JD Squared could give to your business. Because obviously for us to bend this down and weld up three sides is much, much faster than mitering this whole thing, welding all the way around it, and then trying to grind the outside smooth. Plus it's a much more prettier look. Now, We've got it set for a one inch OD radius right here. We could have changed that to an inch and a half. It's variable to whatever you want. Anyway, that's our two pieces right here. Let's go ahead now and bend the actual barbell holders themselves and then we'll put them in position and you can see what we're, we're striving to come up with. Okay, let me show you what I did wrong. Remember I mentioned I didn't come out here and actually run a test on these? Well, I was basing my information on these parts after what I had learned by doing these previously. I've never done the one and a half by three. Well, it turned out they're not the same. The gap one, which is the gap up here and the gap two down there when it's closed down are incorrect numbers. Now, I kind of like it when I screw up every once in a while. You saw Chad grinding in the background and this is not the end of the world. If the V isn't perfect, you could take the grinder like you saw him doing and grind it out a little bit until you could move it um, closer together so it actually is the right angle you want. Just keep in mind that um, if we had done this right where we'd gone out and actually did a test on this, we wouldn't have to do this and this process we'd already almost be done. However, I screwed up. Let's see what we've got right here. Let's see if we can close all the way down. And that's pretty much it. That's where we want to be. If you could do me a favor and pop me a tack weld there. All righty. There we go. That's what we're shooting for right there. And the idea is this particular piece is going to go on the underside of this one right here, kind of like that. All right, give me a second. We'll go ahead and prepare the other uh, seven bins. 
Here's what the piece looks like after we bent it and put the two tack welds in the corner right there. I think you can see how close the V is. Remember, we didn't actually do any trials on this V notch to get the perfect notch. If we had, it would be amazing, but it doesn't have to be because you're going to fill it with some welds anyway, so this is going to work out real good. Now, to show you, this is what it will look like kind of when it's done. They're going to grind around the corners right here, make it look real nice, smooth on the ends, and you'll have a visible bead on the inside. This particular wedge notch is way stronger than a mitered cut. So that's another advantage of wedge cuts right there. Anyway, we'll let Chad go ahead, finish welding up these parts, and then I'll show you what the structure is going to look like before he actually finish welds that. Here's where we're at right now. We've gone ahead and bent them all. Chad has tack welded the corners. They're going to go ahead and weld up the sides and the inside and then I will show you that. Notice I'm a little bit cleaner today. I don't have no dirt on my forehead. I noticed that reviewing the previous segment of the video. Oh well, that's what happens when you work in a metal shop, right? Anyway, let's go ahead and we'll weld this up and then I'll show you the finished welds. Then we'll weld the whole thing up and we'll take it back to powder. Uh, I've got a lot of noise in the background. Apologize for that, but this is a working environment. Anyway, this is one of the pieces finished. Notice we've ground the sides down right here. We've come around the outside of this side here. Very nice, clean, pretty look, but also a very strong joint right there, much stronger than just a mitered part. Wow, I'm getting dirty, in it? Anyway, this is what we've done. We've taken our welding table and we've clamped down the ends. Now we're placing the two top bars, and this is where the barbell is gonna go through, by the way. It's gonna drop right through there into that bottom hole, and we're gonna hold 10 Olympic barbells. Anyway, We've got a spacer in between these two parts and we've got a tube here keeping everything nice and flat. We're going to go ahead right now and tack weld these into place. This is the view from the bottom of the barbell rack. Looking pretty good. Not sure we're going to go ahead and weld. We're going to weld across there, you think? That'd make it look nice, right? Going to do it, do it right. Anyway, that's the bottom of it. While we're waiting on Chad here to get done welding up this thing here, let me show you something pretty funny. Some gentlemen came in out of Pennsylvania. They were told to come pick up a plasma table. They had no idea how big it was. This is actually, this is actually really funny. Uh, so they come to pick a five by 10 machine up with a truck, no trailer, a truck. Now these guys, in all fairness, they're really cool cats. They did not know what they were coming to get. Anyway, look at this here. I'm gonna flip the camera around, it's hilarious. <laughs> there you go. That's our five by 10 hanging off the back end of this truck. You guys don't mind if I put your truck, your machine on camera, do you? Anyway, any other machine, I'd be really concerned. But the MP machines are so doggone rigid and so tough, we're just going to let it hang off the back of the truck. What do you think, man? He's concerned about that side over there, not having yeah. under it. I yeah. think the easiest way. I think we're good. I mean, yeah. He's a good, he's a good yeah, he's yeah, no, I, hey, I... But he's worried about it. He's hey, here's the deal I'll make. If it falls off the truck, it's your bad. If it breaks in half on the way, it's my bad. <laughs> I guarantee you it ain't going to break in half. That is one tough machine. Anyway, all right, guys. Hey, thanks a so bunch. I'll be back in a minute. I just wanted to show some guys what's going on. That's, that's crazy cool, isn't it? That's a bad truck, by the way. This thing is serious. <laughs> I don't know why, but that cracks me up. All right. Let's shoot back. Hey, look at this area here. Remember, in a previous video, this was all full of garbage. We've been cleaning up. Let's head back over here to welding and um, see how our boy's doing. Still welding. You can tell this guy's paid by the hour. Let's see if he's got the backside done. Oh yeah.
There you go. That's our barbell holder. Um, I don't actually own one of these barbells, so I'm assuming it's going to work. Anyway, they got a two inch diameter end, and uh, my, uh, my thinking is the barbells are just going to all stack and rack like this right here. That's our finished piece. It is amazingly hot right now, by the way. Um, everything is fitting exactly flat. Looks great. Let's go ahead and take it back to powder. Well, we made it. We got the whole thing built. This is it right here after powder coating, of course. Got the bars go in and out, easy peasy. The thing's very stable and it looks nice compared to what's on the market out there. So I think we achieved all of our goals. Now, by the way, I'm standing behind the rotary cutter on our multi-platform flat machines. In fact, this one here is actually configured as a wood router. I used it as a base to place the rack on top of it. But this entire project could easily be done on a rotary attachment for the flatbed machines. It requires slight different technique. It's called uh, micro joints, and it's a subject of another video. But just keep in mind, if you've got one of these, you saw me cut this on the RC6. No, you do not have to have an RC6. You can cut it on there. Anyway, if you'd like to see some more projects, I'm going to try to get them out a little bit quicker. Um, hit that subscribe button. I'll try to accommodate you. I know I'm getting ready to do one where we're cutting 8-inch pipe with a 5 8 inch wall thickness. It's going, to be, it's going to be pretty cool. That's to show you the power of the RC6. And, by the way, power of this one too because it's the same cutting head. So, thanks a bunch for watching. Hope you enjoyed it a little bit. Hope you have a great day. And if you're interested in how I did this in the software, stick around for the second half of this video. Other than that, have a great day. Goodbye. In the first part of the video, you saw the um, finished product. In this segment, I'm going to show you how I created that in Camelot. And what it is, it's a barbell holder that my wife has instructed me that her CrossFit trainer needs, which means I'm making a barbell holder. Um, so what I did, I went on Amazon and I pulled up all the ones I could find. I could really only find three. The one that you see in front of you right here, under 100 bucks, super simple to build. We could build this on the um, multi-platform flat machine, easy peasy. However, a lot of people don't have a press brake or something that's going to break something that heavy. Um, so we're not going to do this particular design here. This was the other design I saw even easier couple of seven inch long pieces of I believe it's two inch pipe so it's got a little greater than a two inch ID welded to a flat plate doesn't get no easier than that once again it's not really showing off our machines you know that, that's pretty simple to do also under 100 bucks naturally this is the one that my wife and the trainer liked it's 347 bucks so we're going to build something kind of along these lines but I don't copy other people's products I, I don't if I can't come up with my own, own idea, I don't do it at all. So we're going to do something on the rotary cutter using Camelot. Same functionality, but it's going to be drastically different looking. Now, he needs enough of these holders to hold 30 barbells. No. We're going to do one barbell holder and have him test it out because I'm not going to use tubes. We're going to use nothing but square and rectangular tubing. And I want to make sure it works before I go ahead and bang out the others. So let me go ahead and show you in Camelot how I created it. Now it's going to be a little bit of a tutorial, so I'll slow down in a couple areas, but I'm not going to go into super depth. If you've got any questions on a particular function in Camelot, uh, just email support and I'll make sure that there's a video available describing that function. But I will be talking about what I'm doing as I go along. Anyway, let's get after this thing. Okay, I had to make myself a little bit larger to show you this. As in any project, doesn't matter what kind of CAM software, CAD software you're using, Inventor, SolidWorks, Fusion 360, whatever, you don't typically just dive into a project with no idea what you're doing. And the same is true when using Camelot. So what I did is I created myself a quick little sketch right here. I guess you could kind of see it right there. Um, just laying out the basic dimensions of how I see this thing playing out in my mind. Now, I'm going to be using two by two rectangular tubing and one and a half by three rectangular tubing only because I had the one and a half by three from the last project we did, which was the floor truss, which by the way, 
worked out beautifully. It squared the floor out of the house. They were real happy. So we have a little bit of that one and a half by three left over. We're going to go ahead and use it for this job. The other side of the frame, in my mind, I see two by two squared tubing. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So the first thing we're going to need to do is go to our profile library and make sure that we have those sizes available. The profile library is located on the main ribbon bar menu right here. Let's open it up, take a look. All right, remember I said we're gonna use two by two and the one and a half by three. So let's sort by height and see what we already have in our profile library. And you can see we have a couple sizes. We have a two by three, uh, one and a half by three, but we don't have the two by two, which means I'm gonna go ahead and add it. It's very simple to do. All you gotta do is pick any item, any other row if you want to do it that way and just come over here and start renaming it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to call this two by two by 0.120 wall square tube. These first two fields here are nothing more than descriptive fields. They're just there to help you get an idea of, you know, descriptive field. What, what am I looking at? Now the fields below it, you have round profile, rectangular, general profile, that would be, that's be like if you're going to pull it in from DXF. Let's go ahead, rectangular profile, which is the same as square. We're going to change it to a 2x2. Two two. The corner radius of the square tubing is quarter inch. It does have a wall thickness of 120. We can leave that alone. We're going to leave these numbers alone here, alone. <laughs> these are the numbers that we would use if we were bending this tubing. However, we're not. I am going to leave it at a K factor of 0.5 because rarely in the real world will you ever have a K factor as high as 0.5. Typically, they're going to be in the 0.3 to 0.4 range. And by looking at 0.5, I know in my mind that I have never actually tested this tubing. So the odds are that K factor is incorrect because I put 0.5. Let's go ahead and hit the Add button now. Resort by height. If we come over here, you can see now we have an entry for 2x2. Two two. So. Let's go ahead and start by making the two by two our active profile. And I do that by clicking this button right here. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna click create frame to start the um, structure building process. From the drawing that I showed you earlier, I'm gonna go ahead and do the two sides first. That would correspond to these two plates here. However, we're going to make them out of two by two square tubing. Now, I'm going to go ahead and draw this thing out symmetrical. It makes it a lot easier to work that way if you have a, a structure that is symmetrical. So please follow along and hopefully you'll understand a little bit better. I'm going to go ahead and go to grid and I'm going to turn my grid on, make it visible. Sometimes it's just easier for me to see what's going on by using the grid. I'm going to go to tube and from my drawing, it looks like I need the middle of the or the ends of my rectangular tubing. Let's go ahead. We're going to add a new tube. It looks like I'm going to need them to start at a Y minus 10. I will be showing you this in a second. We're doing um, absolute coordinates. Now, absolute coordinate means in real 3D space, I absolutely want you to place a point here. In a minute, I'll be showing you relative, but right now, we're doing minus 10. So what's going to happen when I develop this thing, we have our axis indicators here, right? So here's your X axis, Y getting positive, going to the right. Neg I mean, X getting positive, going to the right, negative, going to the left. Y going forward, positive, negative the other way. And of course, Z is explanatory. I'm going to be doing a symmetrical. So I'm going to be working on both sides of the X and the Y axis evenly. That's why I picked the Y minus 10 because I'm gonna be somewhere over in this area. In fact, let me zoom out and you'll see. Right down here is our first point. Now, let's go ahead, set the at the next point at, um, we got, we're gonna, it looks like according to my sketch, I got 10 inches that it's gonna be out. Um, we're gonna set it at minus 14. Hopefully this will make a little bit of sense anyway. All right, now if I zoom back out, I'm using the, the the wheel on the mouse. There's our first point right there. Let's go ahead. I'm going to add a second point. This time I am going to go absolutely up to four and a half inches above the floor. So it drew that segment, right? But I want to lean back. So I'm going to go relative down the Y axis, this axis here. I'm going to go four inches. 
so there we go. Now let's go ahead and add another point. And according to my sketch right here, I need to move this one up relative. Let's go 12 inches. All right, there we go. Let's add one more point. I'm absolutely going back to the floor, so that's a simple one. But on the relative on the Y, I'm going to do exactly what I did on this one right here. I'm going to go four inches. And that is our first segment of what we're building. Now, if I go ahead and show this to you from a side view, here's this line right here is your floor, right? If you notice, half of the tubing is below the floor, the other half is above it. Well, I want to cut this tube off flat with the floor. So what I need to do is I need to extend this tube out on each end to get below the floor. So I'm just going to go over here to this tab. I'm going to select extension. I'm going to type in two. Makes no difference how long we make it, just as long as it extends through the floor, which you just saw it do it. Let's go over here now to our next tube point here. Also extend it two inches below the floor. There we go. We can go ahead and close it. That is our first piece. We've placed it right there. Now we're going to go ahead and create the second one. Okay, if we look up here, you can see under transform, we have mirror items. I select that. Now, what I want to go ahead and do is I want to go to my grid real quick, and I'm going to change the plane. Right now, the grid is on the floor, right? I want to go ahead and align the grid with the Z, if I zoom in, the Z and the Y axis. In other words, I want to cut it right through the middle of the part. So let's go ahead and select that axis. Now... If I rotate, you can see what I've done. I have a plane in the middle right there, which will allow me to mirror around that plane. So we're going to go ahead and select this button here, Use Grid as Mirror Plane. There it goes. Now we need to select our items. We're going to select that one. And you can see where in green it has drawn the proposed tube that it wants to create. I have to select copy items here because if I don't, it will simply move this item. It will mirror it to the other side, but it will delete the original item. If you say copy, it leaves the old item and adds the new one. All we got to do now is hit apply. Let's go ahead, close tool. Let's reset the grid back to the floor. Now, if you look, we have our left and our right. Um, I don't know what you want to call them columns, beams, whatever. We have them there. We're looking good. If we turn off the, the visible grid, you can see it would be even better. All right. Now we're going to go ahead and put in the connector tubes. In order to make these tubes, I'm going to need to have a place to connect them onto these other two rails right here. So let's return back to tube. I will hit edit frame. And what I'm going to do is I am going to create reference points. Now reference points aren't points that define the structure of the part. They're just points that you could reference to later. Like, for instance, like what we're getting ready to do is connect these tubes to a reference point. So let's go ahead and add a reference point on the part. And right here, you can see the reference point is in red. And it started on this one here. Reference points are referenced by the point before them. So we have it put in the middle, which is shown over here, percentage value 50%. And we do that by default in Camelot because that's a very common place to put a, um, a reference point if you're going to reinforce some structure you're typically going to reinforce that at the middle of the of the span. So that's why we do that. However, we don't want to do that in this case. So we are going to unselect percentage value. And when we do that, we can now tell it how many inches do you want to place it from the first point. I want it over two and a half inches right there. Okay. Now, let's go ahead, select point two again, because we're going to create another reference point after this point. We're going to say add reference point on part. We are not going to do percentage. We're going to do two and a half inches, but this time we're going to click, or I'm going to click distance measured from next point, which will move it to right there. Now we can go ahead and um, move over here to this one, place our reference points on that. So let's go click on P2 that I used over here on the left side. I used the panels on the left side. And once again, let's go ahead and add our reference point. We are going to unselect percentage, put in 2.5. That's our first one. Let's go ahead and add our second one. Distance measured from the other end. Unselect percentage, 
All right, there we go. We can now close the tool right there. Now we have connector points for um, our uh, cross tubes, whatever we're going to call them. I'm going to make these four tubes out of the one and a half by three inch rectangular tubing we have out there. So let's go select active profile, sort by height so I could find it easier. And there it is, one and a half by three. I am going to go ahead, close, and make this selected profile active. You can see it over here. Now, anything I do in Camelot from now on will be using that size tubing. Let's go ahead and start by adding a new tube. All right. Now, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and get an idea by looking at the coordinates of where these tubes are at. So um, pretty much, um, you know what, better yet, let's go ahead and measure between a uh, select our two points we're going to measure between this and that and i've got 28 inches good that'll that'll work fine all right let's go ahead add our first tube this time instead of telling camelot where in 3d space we want to place the start we're going to use one of those reference points we created earlier so i am going to click driven by point and i'm going to come over here and i am going to select that point right there now i'm going to add a reference point or add another point i mean this time, I'm going to drop down relative on the, the, um, the, from that point right there, I'm going to drop down relative, let's say minus three inches. We'll see what that looks like here in a second. And then I am going to move down the Y or the X axis also three inches. And what I'm trying to accomplish in my mind is some kind of connection right here to where when we cope this tubing, It'll just look a little bit different, that's all. All right, so let's go ahead and add the other point. Now, I've moved over three inches on the X, which means I'm probably going to move three inches over here. So we had, what, 28 inches? So we need to move over at a point relative on the Y, 22 inches. All righty. Now, if I add a point, it's very simple, just driven by a point, and I'm going to select this point here, and there we go. Let's go ahead and look at it from a head-on view. Yeah, that looks pretty good. You can see what I'm doing. I'm dropping down. I'm coming up right there. So that's our first cross member. Let's go ahead and close this tool here. Yeah, that looks pretty good. All right, I am going to go ahead and add the upper tube here next. So let's select Add Tube. Once again, we're going to drive it by a point, and it will be driven by this point here. Let's add a point. We're going to go up relative. We're going to go up this time three inches, and we're going to move over on the X three inches also. All righty, let's go ahead and add a point. Let's move over relative 22 inches. And our final point, we are going to drive it by this point here. And there we go. I'm going to go ahead and close that. And you can kind of start seeing what I'm trying to do. I know you got no idea until I start punching holes through it, start trimming stuff. But this is the effect that I'm trying to achieve. Let's go ahead now and create the rear tubes because each row of tubes is only going to hold five barbells. So let's use the technique we called up earlier where we mirror this to the rear. As I did before, I'm going to go to grid. This time, I want to mirror around the ZX axis, so I will select that right there. Let's turn the grid on so you can see what I'm doing. If I rotate, you can see where I'm going to be mirroring right through the middle of this part, looking at it from the front view. So let's go ahead, go back to tube, select mirror items. We want to use the grid as the mirror plane, so I select that. You can see where we're in the middle now. Let's go ahead and select items. I got to hold down the control key. I got all them, I hit apply. Let's go ahead and close this, go back to grid, reset to the floor. And you can see what we've got right there. Eh, kind of liking it, kind of, kind of cool looking. All righty, let's go ahead and now We've got to go ahead and add holes through these cross members here in order to place the barbells. So to do that, we're going to have to create what we refer to as helper geometry. But first, let's go ahead and um, 
turn off the grid right here. Yeah, let's turn off the grid and go back to tube right there. In fact, let's hit apply and close so we could actually see our handiwork. There it is. You can kind of see what we've got right, right there. Yeah, I'm kind of liking it. It's kind of cool the way it's joining together right there. It's going to be an interesting cut. All right, let's go ahead and knock them holes through this stuff. What I plan on doing is punching holes slightly larger than two inches. I'm guessing maybe two and a sixteenth of an inch. Now, of course, Camelot works in metric too. So if you're looking at this um, overseas or something like that, or you're thinking in metric, all you got to do is change the units. But for this project, we're doing it in inches. So I think I'm going to go like two and a sixteenth of an inch OD. And my plan is to punch through the top of the bottom tube only right here and then completely through these top tubes right here. So I'm going to use a feature in Camelot called helper geometry, which means I need to go ahead and go back to um, main right here, go to my profile library. And if I sort by OD, I don't have anything even close to that. I got a 1.9 OD to a 2.5. So once again, we're going to create ourselves an, an add on into the profile library. So I would type two and a sixteenth of an inch. Let's see. Uh, round tube. Okay. And maybe I'll put OD there. What the heck, right? Okay, OD. And we're going to put it down as mild steel. Once again, these are just descriptive fields. It doesn't matter. 0625 wall thickness. Doesn't matter for what we're doing either. We'll put 120. Lead in, we're not bending this, but I am going to put numbers in that I'm comfortable with. And this is a subject of another video. I hit add. Now, if we sort by OD, you can see where we have our 2.062 entry. We're going to go ahead and close and make that active. Now, we have to return to the frame tab and edit our tubes once again. And here we are. Notice that we have an active profile over here, which is the one that we just created. So let's start by adding the end holes first, and then we will array these things over. The first thing I'm going to do is get an idea about this point right here. And I'm going to go to edit frame. And if I select the point, which I have, it's in red, I can see over here that the absolute coordinates are X minus 11, Y minus three and a half and Z one and a half inches off the floor. So I am going to add a new tube and obviously it's going to be this 2.0625 one here. Let's go ahead and add a new tube. And what we're going to do is we're going to tell it right where we want to start at Y minus 3.5. I want to start at Z 1.5. In other words, I'm trying to get up into that neighborhood of the middle of that tube where you see the red dot. Then I'm going to go X minus nine. And reason is, is I am going to space these out on a four and a half inch spacing. Um, so there'll be five of them in this row. All right. Now all we got to do is add another point. We could go relative up Z. It doesn't matter because this isn't real geometry. This is what we're using um, to cut the holes out through the rectangular. So we have one done right there. Let's go ahead and close that tool out. Okay. What I'm thinking I'm going to do here is copy this tube down the length of this one right here. Um, little four, four copies, four and a half inch spacing. Before we do that, let's go ahead and add the back tube. That's pretty easy. We know we're at 3.5 on the Y. We know we're 1.5 on the Z and the X. We know we're minus nine. Let's go ahead and add a point. We're going to go Z up 10 inches. Once again, I don't care how far, as long as I get through that top tube. And that pretty much um, finishes both those parts right there. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to move and copy these two tubes. In order to make all of our cuts, we're going to have to return to the edit tubes functions. So let's select edit tubes up here on the ribbon. Give it a second. There we go. Now let's take a look at it. We've got our wedge cuts. We're going to need to cope these tubes here so that they wrap around that one there. So let's go ahead and knock them off first pretty quick. We're going to go over here to cut tubes with other cut tubes. Now it's saying select shapes to cut. I'm going to select this one. I'm going to hold down the control key, select that one, 
Let's rotate around here so we can see this one and this one. And then I'm going to select cutting shapes and I'm going to pick this one right here, the green, and hit apply. Now, if we were to zoom in, you could just see what it just did. It just coped those tubes to that shape right there. I, I like that a lot. Let's rotate and let's see something here. Okay, looks like we're crossing over here a little bit, doesn't it? If we zoom in, you can see where we're interfering right there. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and select our cutting shapes. I am going to rotate and I am going to select... Let's do this one and this one. Select the cutting shapes. This time I'm going to pick this one and this one. Apply. All right, let's rotate. Let's see how we did. Okay, hopefully you'll be able to see that okay. Let me um, rotate here a little bit. All righty. Yeah, not bad. Uh, come on now. Show me what you've got. All right, not bad. We may have to trim this a little bit right here if they don't fit. I think it's going to be easier to do that at the welding station and to sit here and play with the software. Let's continue doing our notching. Select shapes to cut. We're going to pick this one, this one, this one, and that one. Select cutting shapes. This one here. Apply. All right, there we go. Now we're going to go ahead and cut these tubes here off with the floor. To do that, we're going to do it different. We're going to go to cut tubes, but we're going to select cut tubes with a face. Select shapes to cut. We're going to cut this one, holding down the control key once again so I can select multiple items. And we are going to use grid as our cut plane. Now, if we go to grid over here, we turn on the grid, you can see where I still have it pretty much at floor level. So we're going to go ahead and use that. Let's go back to tubes. Use grid as cutting plane. Now what the yellow arrow is showing us is anything in that direction is going to get cut off. So let's go ahead and hit cut parts. Now if I wanted to reverse that, I could do that and cut the other way, but obviously we don't want to do that. Let's hit cut four parts. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the grid real quick so we can just see our handiwork a little bit better. Looking pretty good, right? We've got all these coped. Now what we need to do is punch the holes through the tube. Now this is going to get fairly simple because we are going to go back to tube and we're going to say cut tubes with the cut tubes option. Select shapes to cut. We're going to select this shape here. And let's see if we can, let's see what happens if we get them all at one shot. We've got nothing to lose, right? Let's see. Okay, there. I am going to select cut with all others. Anything intersecting those tubes it's going to cut with. Let's see what happens. Hit apply. And there we go. Yeah, I could see right away we did good. See the two holes in the tube up here? We're looking great right now. Let's go ahead and close this. Now what we want to do is we want to make some helper geometry because these tubes here are not part of our finished part. They're just there to help us cut holes. So let's go ahead and zoom out like this. And I am going to select all these tubes by using the window feature. And what it is, if I hold down the shift key and I drag the left mouse button, notice I just highlighted all of those items because using a box with the shift key will select every item that intersects that box in 3D space, no matter how deep it is. That's why it picked up the rear elements, even though we were only selecting a front, because it picked up anything in that square, and that square goes to infinity that we drew. All right, let's go ahead and mark or unmark these. You can see where they faded out. They've disappeared. Let's go here. Now we're going to apply and close. Now it takes a second because Camelot has to store all of this information in a file and get it ready to go. This is why I don't like running Camelot on the computer that's on the machine out there. It's a great industrial computer for running the machine. It's just not as powerful as we could get, for instance, going to Best Buy and buying an $800 computer, even though it costs more than $800. Bucks. Anyway, there's our part. Boy, we're looking good, aren't we? You can see right here the wire form. You can see our notches that we've got. We are looking extremely good. Now it's time to go ahead and generate the files that we need to take out to 
the RC6 in order to make this part. If you look up here in the ribbon bar, you'll see an entry, make jobs for all tubes. And that's what we're going to select. If we had individually selected tubes like this, I could make a job for just those selected tubes. Let's say you had a structure and you only needed those two tubes. You wouldn't want to make a job for all tubes. That's how you would do it um, if you wanted to do specific tubes. However, we want to make the whole part. So let's go ahead and select make job for all tubes. Now what you see down here in the lower is the progress bar is going. Camelot is going through the entire structure and it's looking for every different size of tubing. It could be a different dimensional size. For instance, two by two versus the one and a half by three, that's two different size. It's also looking for things like different wall thicknesses because clearly when we go out to the RC6, we're going to tell the RC6, I want you to cut in this thickness of material. Therefore, it requires a different job. Now, there's a lot of math going on right here, and you're getting ready to see the results. And what it did, it not only found the different tubing and sizes, it's also creating the individual contour lines that we're going to be needing to cut or mark. So that's why it takes a second. Therefore, if we give you the choice of going with the computer that we supply with the RC6 or giving you a discount to go buy your own computer, let's say from Best Buy or Amazon, that happens to be much more powerful, just, just a word of advice. Go ahead and get your own computer. Um, that's what we do out there. We run um, all-in-ones from Best Buy. They're probably on the order of two to three times more powerful than the computer we put on the machine out there. However, they are not industrial rated. Therefore, when you're done with the machine, cover the computer to keep the dust from getting in and ruin it. Well, anyway, what it's asking us to do right now is pick a file. It is determined that there are two different sizes of tubing in this project, the two by two and the one and a half by three. Let's go ahead and pick um, barbell rack one. Now I've already run through this clearly before I started shooting this video, so I already have these files created. However, we're gonna create them again. Let's go ahead and pick barbell rack one. At this point, I do not know what size tube it's looking for. Maybe in the future we need to add that, huh? Now for the second tubing, we're going to pick Barbell Rack 2. And if you notice, it's ending with a JD2 job. And what a job is, is a specific job on a specific size of tubing. So we've got that. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at job 2. And we can tell that job 2 is the rectangular 1.5 by 3 tubing. Whereas job one is the tubes that are the two by two. So we have that right there. Okay, the next step is for us to go ahead and create the contour so that the RC6 could cut this part out. All right, real fast, let me explain to you about layers and operations. Operations are just what I said they are. We're going to be doing an operation on the machine. We're going to be cutting a hole, cutting an end. We're going to be doing something. We're operating on the part out there. Layers are where we store these operations because if you got, for instance, here, if I click on the layer holes, there's a layer tab or panel on the left side here. You can see where we have multiple holes. We're not going to want to put them on an individual layer. So they're all on one layer. Now we can create new layers. We can move items to different layers. We can do a lot of things. We can reorder the contours. However, we're going to keep it simple for this application. For those other items that I just mentioned, check out individual videos that talk about nesting and layers individually, and they'll explain it to you in a little bit more detail. Let's create an operation in the lower left panel down here. Let's create, uh, let's click the plus button. We have PowerMax 85, that's our machine, and we're going to start on the layer start cuts, which is the end layer. Okay, we have our normal offset, and first thing we need to do, though, is go ahead and tell Camelot what consumables we have in the torch out there, and in this case, it's a 45-amp shielded nozzle. Notice right here under contour offset, we could manually override the contours. That's if we wanted to make the holes different sizes, larger, smaller, whatever. However, Camelot is a smart program. It's gone in and it's looked at your part and it's determined that we're dealing with 120 uh, thousands wall thickness. So it went ahead, looked into the table supplied to us by Hypertherm and figured out that the nearest entry we have for a PowerMax 85 with 45 amp shielded consumables is 10 gauge steel and it pre-selected that and picked that as the offset which should work great for us let's go ahead and hit okay 
we now have our first operation down here. Let's go ahead real fast, pick the, do the other two operations. I'm going to select the holes next. And I'm going to make sure I have my 45 amp shielded. And you know what? Looking at the program, obviously we write the software. I'm going to see if I can get our software crew to uh, make this to where when I select the first item, it will automatically default to that selection on the next item. Save us a little bit more time. I'll get on that. Let's go ahead and select OK. All righty. That's our whole operation. Let's go ahead and do our last operation for this part, which will be the end cuts. Change the offset to 45 amp shielded. Say OK. We now have created all of our operations for the 2x2 two two tubing. We're looking, we're looking really good right there. Let's go ahead and the next operation is we have to nest the tubing. We have to tell Camelot how many of these do we want. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and select nest tubes right here. We got to do that. And over here, you got a couple of panels on your right. You got the space at the tube end and the space between the tubes. If I wanted more space between the individual items, this is where I would make those changes. The raw length right here means how long in inches or millimeters or centimeters, whatever you're working with, is a brand new piece of tubing. That's where you would enter that. Now, I could enter tubing over here. Let's just say, for instance, I had a piece, I went out there and I had a piece 150 inches long. Two things happened. One, it entered that tube into our nestings panel over here, and it was able to draw the tube with the chuck now because now it knows specifically how long of a tube you want. If I didn't want to enter a tube because, remember, at the machine out there, we're going to start typically at the end of the tube, so who cares how long the tube is? But sometimes you have short lengths of tube that you want to go ahead and use them up. You want to get rid of them. That's where you would enter those tubes into that panel. And Camelot will try its best to order those parts in those particular lengths of tubing until it finally needs to pull new tubing if you've got too many parts to fit on what you've already told that you have. All right, so we're looking good. We... Over here, we have said we want one of each part. We could change that if we want. However, we don't. Now we can go ahead and hit the nest button. And there's our two pieces on the end of our nest. Notice right here, Camelot has rotated the pieces and fit them together, trying to minimize the usage of tubing. If I went over here and changed this to five inches, watch what happens. Camelot, now if we hit nest tubing, is going to open that space up. You can see we've got a lot of space right there, five inches. Let's go back to 0.5, no point wasted tubing. All right, there we go. Now, since we've nested it, we can come along and we can run the post processor by clicking up here in the left top of the screen. Now, it's gonna ask us to pick a file name because it's gonna go ahead and create the NC code that we're gonna run on the machine out there. Now, since I've already done this before, I've already recreated some names. Right here, we're on barbell rack one, you can see up here, and I've just gone ahead and I've added two by two to it so that we know that's the size of the tube. I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. Yes, I wanna replace it. Let's give it a second. And over here on the right, you're gonna see the code pop up. And this is all of the G code that we need to take that file, put it on a USB, take it out to the machine and run that program. That's the one for our two by two. That's it, believe it or not. Once I do that, we can go out to the machine. However, let me real quick go ahead and do the one and a half by three. I will tell you what I'm doing, but I'm not going to dwell on any, any individual items. And what I'm trying to do is give you an idea that once you understand the program, how quickly you could actually work through it. So let's go ahead and do that. Let me go ahead and go back to our barbell rack two job right here. This is clearly our one and a half by three inch tubing. And real quickly, I'm gonna go ahead and add my operations. I'm gonna start on my start cut. I'm gonna go 45 amp shielded. I'm gonna say, okay. Let's go ahead and add another operation. Let's go ahead and do the holes once again. Okay. And our final operation is going to be the end cut. So let's pick that. 45 amp shielded and we're good. All right, so we have all our operations. If I come down here and I click on them individually, you can see what parts of the tubing they're going to be doing. See, in the holes layer, you've got all the holes and you've got the wedge cuts because there are holes in the tubing. Let's go ahead. we got our end cuts right here. We're looking good. Now it's time to nest this. 
I'm not going to tell it a length or anything. I'm just going to go ahead and say nest tubes. And there they are. There's our four tubes. You can see that looks really, really nice. Let's go ahead and run our post processor. Now I'm going to go ahead and save this as the barbell bell rack two. I don't know why I got bell in there twice. One and a half by three. Let's do that one. Now our code will pop up here on the right side. That'll be our G code that we're going to take to the machine. Let's give it a sec. Quite a bit of quite a bit of code that it wrote right there. So you can see it right here. I mean that is a lot of code that it created. All righty, we're looking good right there. Now let me go ahead and show you another feature in Camelot, and it's animate. In this particular function here, Camelot, we could verify that everything is in the correct order. We could change the animation speed. That was the new feature we just added. Let's speed it all the way up. Okay, it looks pretty darn good. We're going in the right direction, right? We're starting on the end. We're moving towards the chuck. Now, if I didn't like the order of cuts, I can go back into the individual parts and reorder them. That's the subject of another video. I'm just throwing that out there to you of what you can do. Let's go ahead and stop at this point right here. Well, that is it. That is everything we need to do in Camelot in order to create these parts. The next thing I will have to do is put these two files on a USB, take them out to the machine, and cut the parts out there. But clearly, we've already done that because I've showed you the finished product. So, how I'd like to end right here is obviously thank you very much for taking your time out to watch it. I hope we've answered some questions for you. We are doing as many projects as we can. I couldn't do any in the last couple weeks because there was a couple things in the software I wanted to get done. Um, for instance, smart nesting and a couple other things I wanted to take care of. So I had about a two or three week lull time. I wasn't able to do videos. However, we are back up and running real good. I'm really loving the way the software is working and I've got some other stuff to show you. So anyway, if you want to see these projects, please subscribe and um, we'll bang them out. I know, for instance, the next project I think we're doing is the Giants Wedding Band. And what it is is I've got some 8-inch tubing out there with a 5 8 inch wall. I don't want to cut a large piece of this tubing because stuff I think is like $150 a foot. So what I came up with is the idea of making a wedding band for a giant because then I can cut out about a 3-inch, something pretty cool looking out of the heavy material, and you'll see the RC6 cutting larger than 6-inch pipe. Um, anyway, once again, I really appreciate you for, for watching. Thanks a bunch. And from the people at JD Squared, goodbye. Hope you have a great day.